He opened his trunk and we all started to laugh at him. What was an 18-year-old guy doing with a DVD of Beaches in his trunk? Now, some of you have no idea what the movie is. It's a chick flick. Bette Midler sings something about wind and wings and other nonsense. I don't know. But we all were laughing at him, and he just smiled. We're like, do you really like this movie? It's like, nope. But the girls I ask out on a date do. So I'm like, hmm. So I went, I, I went on a date not too long after that, and, and so I, I looked over after dinner, and I'm like, hey, I'm going to go back to my parents' house and watch Beaches. Soak it in, ladies. Soak it in. <laughs> and my dad was like, no. <laughs> What's beaches? And then I learned that there's, there's a great method here, but I just had to adapt. And so I made it a little more current. And so it wouldn't be long, but in a few years, I was the proud owner and would be following around in my trunk of my car. We're a walk to remember. For Love of the Game, which is just a great baseball movie, and Kevin Costner was born to be in baseball movies and westerns, and it's fantastic, and it's the greatest game ever, and there's a love story, and so if the date was like, yes, let's watch this, then a second and third date were almost guaranteed just based on that alone. I also had copies of When Harry Met Sally, Garden State, Notting Hill, saw all those movies way more times than I would like to admit to, because none of them are great movies, but it wasn't, it wasn't about me watching the movie I really wanted to watch except for Love of the Game. That was like, oh, that is the unicorn. That is the rare, that is the rare woman that you dream of that loves all things love in baseball just as much as you do. I love, I love Brooke. She loves sports, and it's just like God's blessing to me. I have been to more zoos in my life I, I am not an animal guy. I have no desire to walk around a zoo and watch animals sleep and eat and stand there and stare at you. But it's not about me at this point in my life when I was dating people. And so I have been to more zoos, botanical gardens. Like, whoever thought up this idea of botanical gardens, I will never understand. I have been to botanical gardens. I have been to art museums. I do not appreciate most art because it doesn't make sense to me. I don't know if you saw a couple months ago, somebody taped a banana on something and it sold for over $100,000. Like, what more proof do you need that our world has lost its mind, right? So I am not the person that wants to traipse through an art museum all afternoon and try to guess what a person who probably was just utilizing a lot of drugs or screwed up on their project and then just said, you don't understand, it's not a mistake, it's art. And then gullible people were like, that is brilliant, brilliant. And then they put it up and I'm just like, I don't get it, and I'm not the smartest guy in the world, I get it, so it's probably just beyond me, but I have been to botanical gardens, I have been to art museums, I have been to zoos, I have done picnics, I hate eating outside, it's miserable. Why not combine a great thing, food, with bugs? What a wonderful combination. You know what goes great with a sandwich? Having to swat away mosquitoes constantly when you eat it. That's just wonder. But I have done picnics where I have packed up a lunch. I put it in a wicker basket. I folded a blanket. I was miserable the whole time. And most embarrassingly, most embarrassingly of all, I have gone to dinner at Panera Bread. Listen, <laughs> Panera Bread is an appetizer. No man... No man wants to go to Panera Bread and be like, you know what sounds great for dinner? Half a sandwich and half a cup of soup. Boy, that's just going to tide me over till tomorrow. But I've done it. I've done it. I've eaten dinner at Panera Bread. Why? Because I wanted dinner at Panera Bread? No. If I never darkened the door of Panera Bread again, it wouldn't be soon enough for me. But it wasn't about me. Now, I didn't have to do any of those things per se? Some of you are like, oh yes, you did, Brian. You needed, you needed that and more. Trust us. I didn't ha- but I would like to think I didn't have to do any of those things on the surface, but I wanted to do them. 
I wanted to do them not because it was about me, but I wanted to do them in an effort to win somebody over. In an effort to win somebody over. And honestly, that's, that's what a lot of dating is. It's you pretending to like things that you don't really like and them pretending to like things that they don't really like. And then you falling in love and then discovering, oh, you, you don't really like that? Oh, well, I don't really like this. And, and then year three or four marriage happens. You're like, who did I even marry? I don't, everything's a lie. But, but a lot of, that's a lot of dating is just putting your best foot forward and it's putting aside your own desires And that's so easy in the process of falling in love, not because you have to, but ultimately because you want to, because you want to. This morning, we're going to talk about this concept, but in a little bit of a different light. We're going to talk about this concept and how it should drive us, not not in dating, but in how it should drive us with how we interact with people. And how we should elevate the needs and desires of other people above our own. Not because we're under obligation to do that. But instead because we care about people that much. So if you have your phones or your tablets, you can follow along with us in an app that's completely free. And we recommend that everybody download it. It's a great app. It's called the Bible app. So you can go to your app store of of whatever device you're using and just type in Bible. It's the very first one that pops up. Download that. You can incorporate that in your week to engage with Scripture. It will send you a verse if you enable notifications on your phone or your tablet where it will push that through automatically to you. It has reading plans that take you everywhere from a verse or two a day up through the whole Bible in a couple months to a year. And and there's just something for everything you're going through. We cannot emphasize this enough. It's all completely free, and we highly recommend it. Once you download it and open the app, there's an event tab uh, under the menu. You go to events, and then you put in your zip code, or you enable locations if you're not worried about the government tracking your every step. And there... And there you will see Lakeside Community Church. You click on that and you can follow along with us. We're in the middle of something we're calling correction. It's a look at a book that's called 1 Corinthians because it was written to a church that was in a town called Corinth. And it was written to them by an old pastor who still loved the people very much. He loved the society. He loved the town. And we've been walking through that book and we're so excited that you're joining us here today to to join us as we walk through. And we're going to jump in at the second half of 1 Corinthians 9. We're going to jump in at verse 19, the first half. Paul, who wrote the book, he discusses all the rights he's putting aside, not because he has to, but because he loves the people that much that he wants to elevate their needs and their desires above his own. And then we find these words in 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I am free from all, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. What he says is, I'm going to lay aside what I want for the betterment of you. I'm going to lay aside what I want for the betterment of you, not because I have to, but because I want to. What we see here declared and displayed in a very real sense is this declaration that people matter. People matter. They matter so much to him that he says, I could do things. I could do things. I have the right to do them, but I'm going to throw that aside because I love you and I value you that much more, that I want to elevate you. And in order to do that, I am going to become a servant to you. My life is going to be marked and defined by the fact that I'm not in it just for me. That my aim and my goal and my focus of life isn't just to serve myself and to build my own empire, but instead, I'm going to go and I'm going to serve others. And the first step to doing that is laying aside some things that I feel really passionate about. And listen, we've all done this. We've all done this. Every single one of us who is married has done this. Every single one of us who's ever gone out on a second or third date has done this. Every single one of us who has kids has done this. So we all understand the principle of it, and yet it gets difficult at times because we like the things we like. That's just natural, and that's just normal. 
And as people who like the things we like, what happens is, well, the things that we like, we give more emphasis to, naturally. It's just, it's just natural. It doesn't mean that you're selfish. It doesn't mean that your life is out of balance. It's just a natural inclination. When something feels good, when you like something, you give it more time, you give it more emphasis, you give it more effort because you like it. And that's just how you're wired. And all of us are wired differently, and that's perfectly okay. But what he says is, I understand that you matter. And you're not wired like I'm wired. So rather than there just be this disconnect all the time, I'm going to be the one that tries to bridge that gap. And the way I'm going to try to bridge that gap is by saying things that I really care about and things that I really feel strongly and passionately about, I'm willing to put off to the side in order that I can build the bridge to be a part of your life. And that's the mindset that each of us who follows Jesus needs to have. That we have to stop worrying about whether we're right all the time or whether somebody else is wrong. Where scripture is clear, we do not, we don't mess around. Where scripture is clear, that's our standard. That's what we hold to. And yet there are so many areas and just passions that people have in ways that they're wired where we have to be willing to lay aside some of our own passions and some of our own ways that we're wired in order to meet them and in order to be invested in their life. And that's what he says he's going to do. He says, to the Jews, I became as a Jew. In order to win Jews, to those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. He says, I don't agree with them. I don't agree with them. But I engage to show them Jesus. I don't agree with where they're at. But I engage to show them Jesus. He says, I think they're wrong. But rather than focus on that, I'll meet them where they are. And then he continues in verse 21, to those outside the law. I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. And here's what he says. He says, I don't agree with them either. I don't agree with them either, but I engage them to show them Jesus. They're also wrong, but but rather than focus on that, I'll meet them where they are. And then he says this, to the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people. That by all means, I might save some. And might I suggest that in our context of here at Lakeside, in our world right now at large, the world needs a lot more of this mindset. I have become all things to all people that by all means, I might save some. All things to all people. Practically, let me give you a couple implications of how this plays out here at Lakeside. Every pastor who comes on staff, every pastor who comes on staff, who joins the team at Lakeside, commits, voluntarily commits to keeping their political views to themselves. Why? Because there is nothing that's going to alienate people faster than us standing and trying to articulate political positions or to take a position of a candidate. Here's the reality. Democrats need Jesus. Republicans need Jesus. Independents need Jesus. Socialists need Jesus. Libertarians need Jesus. You don't affiliate with anything. You still need Jesus. That is universal. That is universal. And here's the problem. Don't misunderstand me. Politics matter. They do matter. Politics and the positions of politicians, they really matter. But here's what we have to never lose sight of. This world is completely broken. This world is completely broken, and Jesus is the only cure. Jesus is the only cure. Because we have seen in history times when Democrats have held every branch of government, and we still have problems. We have seen times in history where Republicans have held every branch of government, and we still have problems. We have seen monarchies. We have seen socialist regimes. We have seen dictators. We have seen democracies. We have seen you name it. The world has tried it. And guess what? The world is still broken. The world is in desperate need of a cure. And Jesus is the cure. Not a polit- political party or ideology. So arguing about politics, it matters. But it's like determining if you've ever gone through the heart-wrenching decision. When somebody gets a diagnosis and the doctors have tried everything that they can, everything that they can, and there's just no cure available, the decision oftentimes that the family's faced with is then finding the best long-term care facility to put the person in so that they can get the care that they desperately need. That's essentially what our politics are. 
When we're arguing about things, we're arguing about things that really, really matter. But understand, the cure for these things is Jesus. What we're arguing about is the best way to bring about the comfort and the best way to express concern and care for people. But ultimately, the only cure for all of the things that are broken is Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, our focus must be on the cure, and that cure is universal, and it is Jesus. So all things to all people. That covers politics. All things to all people. I don't get it. I, I've been here almost almost two years now, a year and a half. Algoma is a great place. Algoma is a great place. I don't get the rivalry with Kiwani. I just don't get it. Like, I'm from the outside, and I know that people from Algoma are supposed to hate people from Kiwani, and people from Kiwani are supposed to hate people from my, I don't get it. I really don't. Algoma's a great place. Kiwani's a great place. Sturgeon Bay's a great place. Luxembourg's a great place. Casco's a great place. Dykesville's a great place. Brussels is a great place. Forestville's a great place. Green Bay is a great place. I just don't get it. I don't get the rivalry. And, and we're not about that. We don't care what neighborhood or community you come from here. We love you, and you're welcome here, and we're glad that you're here. Why? Because Jesus is bigger than what football team you root for, or what basketball team you root for, or what rivalry you have with another town from 100 years ago because this person did this, and then this person responded with this way. And it doesn't matter to us where you live. We're sure you live in a great place. But here's the point. We're not going to be divided. We're going to be unified. All things to all people. It doesn't mean you can't go and sit on different sides of a basketball game and make fun of the other team who lost at the end of the game. That's great. But when it becomes a part where you're like, I don't like those people. I don't go to that town. What? I don't get it. I don't get it. Listen. Listen to what he says at the end. All of this, all things to all people, to save some. You aren't going to win everyone. You aren't going to win everyone. Quit worrying about that. Honestly, quit worrying about that. We've talked about it before, and we'll talk about it again today. Some people live in a prison that they have built for themselves because they constantly want the adoration of everyone. And it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. And if that is your goal, and if that becomes your marker of success, that you are universally loved, you will allow yourself to become discouraged, and you will never accomplish all that you could accomplish, because it's never going to happen. There are going to be people who simply do not like you. And this doesn't mean go out of your way to give them a reason not to like you, but it does mean just embrace the fact. Embrace it. Not everybody's going to love you. Don't be a jerk, but just come to terms with it. And quit worrying about the fact that not everybody loves you. You do you. Be the person that God has, has wired you to be. And live with this mindset that when it comes to you, you're going to do everything that you can. You're going to do everything in your control to be all things to all people. So that when other people are like, mm, I hate that person. Other people look at them and say, really? What's wrong with you? You can't win everybody. So quit worrying about it. But still try. Still try. Try to be all things to all people. When you find people that just hate you for no reason, still love them. You be Jesus. You smile. Don't give them a reason. Don't be like, well, if they hate me, might as well give them a reason to hate. No, 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 no. (laughs) Don't do that. And here's why. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. That life is bigger about me because we understand that life is all about Jesus, proclaiming his name and seeing the fame of God expand. Then he says this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? I am so glad, I am so glad the Apostle Paul wrote this book when he did, because could you imagine if he was writing this now? 
Be like, do you not know that every player in Little League gets a trophy at the end of the year, even if they didn't get a hit all season long? <laughs> like, it's absolute madness what has happened. We, we've turned competition into this, this horrible thing. I have a friend, and he was part of a baseball team. And the league in which they played had no extra innings. Strike one. And so they actually had, they actually had a cap ties in the greatest game that God ever created of baseball, which the league should have been disbanded right then and there. Just, that, that is just evil. They were leading, heading into the last inning, but the other team was home, so they got to hit. Their coach was on the bench telling them, guys, you need to focus, because if the other team gets the run limit this inning, we're going to tie. And the team mom spoke up and said, don't worry about it, guys. A tie's as good as a win. And my friend's dad, who was sitting next to the bench, said, gentlemen, that is a lie from Satan himself in the pit of hell. <laughs> Never believe that a tie is as good as a win. You go out, you play focused baseball, and you win the game. And that's what they did. They went out, and they won. Now, I understand that we want to teach kids, I understand that we want to teach kids all the fundamentals, and that's great. That's great. I also understand that we want everybody to, to have a chance to go at it and to discover whether or not they, they love the sport. That's awesome. But I don't understand when my kid's on a t-ball team, and then we score two runs all game, and the other sco team scores 27 runs that game, and then another parent asks their kid, who's on my son's t-ball game, who won... And they tell their kid, oh, your team, of course. I'm like, our team? Our team? Our team should go try swimming or something because there's nobody on our team who should keep playing baseball. This is a disaster. Forget the participation trophies, the Apostle Paul says. He says, just remember this. When you run a race, one person, one person gets the gold, all right? The great theologian Ricky Bobby said it this way. If you ain't first, you're last, all right? That's somewhere in the... Chronicles of History. So then, then he continues. Then he continues. So run that you may obtain it. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable wreath. Here's what he says. Live your life with focus, purpose, and discipline. Live your life with purpose, focus, and discipline. And he draws this analogy of a runner who goes out and who trains their body because they keep the prize at the forefront of their minds. They remember there is one gold medal. There is one person who walks away victorious over all the rest. There is a reason that we still talk about Michael Jordan when we think about greatness in terms of basketball players because of his drive. Was there God-given athletic ability without question? If I practiced as much as Michael Jordan, it would not matter. I'm still a six-foot-tall white guy who cannot jump. That's just the reality of the genetics and the genes that God has given me. Michael Jordan, much taller than I, much faster than I, had a lot more God-given ability than I, but he also unrelentingly put in the time, the energy, and the effort at practice. He would punch his teammates in the mouth when they didn't practice well. Am I excusing that? No. But understand the intensity level there that drove him to be the greatest who played the game of all time. And what Paul is saying is, remember, remember what drives you. As followers of Jesus, remember why you live your life. You live your life for the fame of Jesus. You live your life to proclaim the hope that we have in this broken world. Everything you do needs to be done with that in mind. Live your life intentionally, with purpose, with focus, and with discipline. Live that way. Remember the stakes. He says, remember the stakes. Athletes do this for, for a prize, for a gold medal, for a championship ring, for a trophy. But all those things go away. 
All those things fade. Time comes and champions are forgotten. Trophies break down. Athletes go broke and have to pawn their championship rings. He says all these things happen and they're fleeting. Those championships, as awesome and as incredible as they are, to achieve that moment of greatness, to be better than all the rest, all of that is there but for a moment. And then it becomes a memory. He says, now contrast that with the life that is lived sold out to following Jesus. And that is a championship that never fades. Because this is something that lasts for all eternity. Remember the stakes. These victories, these victories last forever. And so because of that, he finishes by writing these words. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. What he says is this isn't a fun run. This isn't a fun run where everybody gets together and we're going to do a little 5K. It's going to be awesome. We'll all wear white shirts and have paint thrown on us. It's going to be great. We'll get a giant turkey leg at the end and everybody gets a medal. That's not what this is about. He says, no, 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 no. This has meaning. This is purpose. This matters. And so because of that, because of that, I'm going to unapologetically live in such a way that I am determined, I am focused, and I have a purpose in the way I live my life. And so the challenge for us who follow Jesus is this. To live lives that are intensely focused. Intensely focused. And remember what we're all chasing after. And remember what we're all chasing after. We live lives that are intensely focused and we remember what we're chasing after. Does this mean that everybody has to be a pastor or an evangelist? Absolutely not. But what it means is that sometimes the greatest the greatest way we can portray the hope that we have in Jesus is by doing the right thing in our business, is by being incredibly driven in our career and doing the right thing and not taking any shortcuts, but instead putting in the hard work and saying, I am going to show you that I can run a successful business. I can be an executive without compromising my morals. I am going to do the right thing, and I'm going to treat people fairly and kindly, and I'm still going to get the job done. And that can be the greatest example for Jesus that somebody could ever hear. It's you showing up for the shift in the middle of the night when you don't want to be there at all. Saying, I have an opportunity. I have an opportunity to put in these hours and to impact the people that I work alongside. I have an opportunity to say something about myself in the product that I produce. It's heading into the classroom and pouring your life into those of your students and teaching them the essentials, absolutely but being willing to share with them and spend a little more time and encourage those who are so frustrated because they're not getting it and to come alongside those who have a horrible home life and to compliment them and to be the person that just makes them think, you know, maybe after all there is some hope for me. To let the kid know that you believe in them. 
What we're talking about here is not everybody having to be a pastor or an evangelist and go out and use every conversation that they have to try to steer every person that they know to Jesus. Is that the goal, that we steer people to Jesus? Absolutely, unequivocally, yes. Because that's the cure. But in the process, we're all things to all people. So that we can comfort the hurting. And help the broken. So what does all this mean? Well, first we have to value the people that God has put in our lives. We have to value them. And the greatest way that we can show people that we value them is we have to be willing to sacrifice for them. Be willing to sacrifice for the people in your life. Secondly, lovingly engage people you don't agree with. Not for a fight, not to change their mind, but lovingly engage people you disagree with. All for the hope that you might disagree. You may forever disagree on the best way to provide comfort and care, but that one day you can agree on the cure. Remember our focus needs to be on that ultimate cure. That needs to be our focus. And so we don't let all these things that can so easily divide us become these huge issues. We, we just refuse to allow that to happen. And we just keep our focus on Jesus. We say, we're going to disagree on some elements of comfort and care, but the cure is universal and the cure is Jesus. And that is ultimately what matters. So we just refuse. We refuse to become divided. Just refuse to let it happen. And lastly, that we live with purpose, focus, and discipline. Because God has you where he has you for a reason. And he wants to do something in your life. To share the hope of Jesus with the people you come into contact with. No day is a wasted opportunity. No assignment is a throwaway. Remember the cure. And do everything you can to share it with everyone you can. God, I pray that we would be people who live our lives with intensity, with passion, with focus, and with purpose. I pray we would be people who do all we can to point others to you. that you would help every person here see the value in the assignment that they have and in the context that they're in. That we would proclaim the hope that we have in you by giving our best and intervening in the stories and the lives of others. God, I pray that as, as Lakeside, we would just refuse, just refuse to be divided on anything that doesn't matter. And we would, be ref, we would just refuse to be divided even on things that do matter, but where, God, that there's, there's ability to have different perspectives based on Scripture. That the hope of Jesus would be our forefront. It would be what drives us. And God, not just what drives us here with people from Algoma, but also with people from Kiwani and Sturgeon Bay and Dykesville and Brussels and Forestville and Casco and Luxembourg and Green Bay. God, that we would be a place of hope and encouragement for people in this region to move one step closer to you and to reach people who need the ultimate cure. We ask, God, that you would take us and use us for your glory. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.